Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know where a lot of the folks who aren't here are. <laughs> well, it's Wanda's birthday, so I gave her an excuse to absence. <laughs> yeah. So, and my mom has to assist with surgery at 6.30 tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I know a, I know a few where they are. We may still have some people trickle in, but otherwise I'll go ahead and get started. And tonight, when we get started, we're going to be starting at the beginning of 3rd Maccabees, because we finished 2nd Maccabees last time, two weeks ago. And... Third Maccabees, as I've, I've mentioned a couple times, that was a little different than First and Second Maccabees. Uh, it's called Third Maccabees because it takes place at roughly the same time period as First and Second Maccabees. But unlike First and Second Maccabees, it's not actually about the Maccabees. There are no Maccabees in Third Maccabees. <laughs> right? so, so Judas Maccabeus and the, and the revolt he starts to free Judea. This is, again, it's around that time. It's actually the generation before that it takes place at the end of the 3rd century. So the late 200s. Uh, it takes place, but it's going to take place primarily, other than right at the beginning, primarily in Egypt. Okay. Now because of that time period and thematically, thematically we're dealing with here Ptolemy, who is the, the Greek king of Egypt, Alexandria, and all Africa. We talked about before, when I was doing the introduction to 1st Maccabees, how Alexander the Great, after he had conquered the world and he died, he didn't leave a successor, so there wasn't sort of a Greek empire. But he said he left his empire to the strongest with the intent that his generals would compete to see who would get it. His generals, at least that first generation, were sort of tired of battle by that point, so instead they decided to divvy things up. As we talked before, in First and Second Maccabees, we saw the family line of, the, of Seleucus, the Seleucids, who was one of uh, Alexander's generals, who was in charge of his sort of special ops team. Uh, Egypt was left to his general Ptolemy, and if you ever saw the movie, which I don't recommend, but if you saw, <laughs> if you happened to see the movie Alexander at some point, and one of the 23 different cuts they made of it, that Oliver Stone made of it, it's, not a, it, it's more soap opera than <laughs> history. But <laughs> if, if you happened to see that movie, the character Anthony Hopkins played in it was Ptolemy, who sort of narrates it and, and sets it up at the beginning. He's ta playing Ptolemy his general who was given was given Alexandria as his capital, which Alexander had founded and named after himself, very modestly. And, and Alexandria was the capital of Egypt and all Africa. And we talked before about how that those basic divisions were carried over into the Roman Empire and then carried over even into the Christian church. That's why we have a patriarch of Alexandria and all Egypt and Africa. And why we have a patriarch of Antioch and all the East. It's from those same basic divisions. So, the story we're about to, to read takes place, as I said, about a generation before 1st and 2nd Maccabees. 1st and 2nd Maccabees, remember, sort of the setup event, what starts the revolt, revolt is Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, who is the king of Syria at the time, on his way back from a war some infighting with Egypt, stopped in Jerusalem and set up the idol to Zeus and sacrificed, sacrificed a pig on the altar that was known as the Abomination of Desolation, and that touched off the revolts. Well, this his story is going to take place in his father's generation. So at the time this is taking place, it's Antiochus III, Antiochus IV's father, who's ruling in Syria. 
and it's Ptolemy the Fourth, who's uh, ruling, who's ruling in Egypt. And Ptolemy the Fourth, we talked about how the Syrian kings all took their little titles at the end. Uh, Epiphanes, you know, being the manifestation of of God. Uh, Ptolemy the Fourth. Gives himself the surname Philopator, which means loving father. <laughs> Again, very modestly. <laughs> loving father. He also, he also, following Alexander, when Alexander came and conquered Egypt, up until that point, Egypt was ruled by the pharaohs. As we saw going all the way back in Exodus, there was a pharaoh. The pharaoh was considered to be one of the gods. Okay, and so when Alexander came and defeated the pharaoh, there's a, there a brief religious crisis. <laughs> they very quickly decided two things. Number one, that must mean Alexander was the real pharaoh. <laughs> and number two, that must mean Alexander was a god. And we have... We have sculptures and uh, and wall frescoes that were made at the time of the priests worshiping Alexander as a god, okay, including some really creepy ones. That if, <laughs> if you ever see a documentary about this, one of the ways they set this up to demonstrate that Alexander was a god is they would have a carving of Alexander standing there. They would have a priest with a bowl pouring oil over Alexander's phallus. <laughs> over his genitals. So that was... <laughs> which are exaggerated as well. <laughs> so the idea was to connect him. We talked before about uh, at one point when we were talking about why, why you couldn't eat a uh, calf boiled in its mother's milk. <laughs> Back in the law, we talked about some of the pagan rituals. And there's a particular pagan ritual surrounding Osiris and Osiris's genitals. And so that was meant to connect. Osiris was the, the god of the dead. So that was meant to connect Alexander to Osiris and their worship. But so those, those frescoes were everywhere. And Ptolemy, his general, all the way through to Ptolemy the Fourth is considered to be the pharaoh and successor. So he's likewise considered to be a god by the people in Egypt. So you can already probably tell just from that setup how this might cause problems with the Jewish community in Egypt. <laughs> right? You can already see this probably in the long term is not going to go well. As another note, Cleopatra, who we've all heard of, uh, is going to be the descendant of this family line. Cleopatra was not Egyptian, she's Greek. Uh, and she's going to live in the first century BC. So she's about 120 years after, after what we're reading now. But she's the eventual, from this family line, she's the eventual ruler. And then she, of course, we'll, we'll actually talk about her a little more in a couple years when we get to the... <laughs> When we get to the New Testament, because believe it or not, in addition to being involved in the founding of the Roman Empire, because she has relationships with both Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, she also had a liaison with Herod the Great for some period of time. <laughs> he was king. So when we get into the New Testament, we start talking about Herod, she'll turn back up. So she got around. <laughs> she had she had a unique way of sealing political alliances. Um, but so that's, that's again, that's from this, this same family. So that is, that is by way of setup. That, so unlike, unlike in Judea where you have the Syrians, Greeks, coming in with pretty much straight Greek culture and trying to impose it, what you have in Egypt is this sort of as the example of Alexander you have this mishmash of the old pagan Egyptian culture 
worshipping the pharaoh and worshipping the Egyptian gods mishmashed with Greek culture with Greek culture and learning Okay, at this time in history the library at Alexandria is being built this is the process of being being put together and constructed this was one of the major projects that the Ptolemy line started when it was completed it was one of the wonders of the ancient world one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and the goal was to have the sum total of all human knowledge in in the library at Alexandria in Egypt <laughs> well so they collected books that were scrolls, books they were called codexes at the time and we kind of write they could from all over the Greek world, from Rome, from North Africa, from as far away as India. And that is how we ended up with the Septuagint. Remember we talked about that, that they wanted to have a copy of the Hebrew scriptures in the library at Alexandria. And that's what started the Greek translation that we now know as, as the Septuagint Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint refers to the 70 because it, traditionally there were 70 rabbis who, who translated it. So that's, that's how we ended up with was that project. Okay. So we're, we're going to see the, the Ptolemies from a particular ex perspective. <laughs> right, <laughs> obviously. From a religious perspective in terms of, of their interacting with Judaism. But it is important to, to, to give the devil their due here. <laughs> in terms of human learning and science <laughs> and the arts and that kind of things, this family did make unparalleled contributions in terms of this world, <laughs> in terms of worldly learning. And even through the Septuagint, I mean, the Septuagint is a major religiously, you know, in God's providence. So it's important that historically we have both sides because as I said this, this book is going to be remarkably <laughs> negative <laughs> I guess. Um, just as one last note since I brought up the library at Alexandria there's a movie <laughs> there's a movie that was filmed recently and I'm trying to remember the title it'll come to me it'll come to me but it's about the destruction of the library of Alexandria and the Library of Alexandria got burned down in uh, the 4th century, in the 300s. And what happened at that time, obviously there, were, there was a Christian patriarch in, in Egypt. And Christianity and paganism were competing. And there were a number of riots where something would happen. Not that anything like this happens today or in the Middle East. But <laughs> where, you know, a Christian would be killed under some kind of mysterious circumstances, they would blame the pagans, right? People would take to the streets, and then a pagan would, you know, something would happen to a pagan out in the street, and you get hit with a rock, you know, and all, all kinds of mob violence kept breaking out. But the bishop and the, the civil authorities had to keep breaking up. Well, this movie, this movie, uh, it's a big budget Hollywood movie too. Basically portrays that the Christians bur burn down the library of Alexandria because they hate science. <laughs> they hate literature. They hate literature. And they especially hate women. <laughs> because there was a, a famous woman philosopher at the time who was in, who was in charge of it. And they show this, they, they, they show this movie about every two weeks now on Showtime. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what. But, um, <laughs> but, but, just to comment on that movie, that movie is so far removed from history. I mean, every review, even, even people who don't like Christianity who have reviewed this movie, right, have said there's not an ounce <laughs> <laughs> historical, right? That it's totally taking modern things and trying to read them back into into history. But so, just in case you run into somebody and somehow the Library of Alexandria comes up, <laughs> and they say, "Oh yeah, the Christians burned that down because they hate science and women," you know, <laughs> you're 
you're going to respond to them that, that they need to read a book and that that movie was <laughs> completely, completely fictional. And, and the name will probably come to me by the, by the end of the night. So, it'll, it'll come to me. Yeah, it's going to bug me, but it'll, it'll come to me and I'll let you know. What actually happened was nobody, nobody knows who started the fire. It, it burned down during one of the riots. And there were Christian participants and pagan participants. It was a huge riot. And a lot of people were killed on both sides. There were a lot of deaths. And it wasn't just the library that got burned down. It was a big chunk of the city of Alexandria that got burned down. Well, Stephen, so. am I correct that I thought I read an article not too long ago within the last year, maybe two, that archaeologically, off of Alexandria, submerged. They think they have found the foundations and the buildings and all yeah. that area for the library and all of it. A it's, Alexandria. It's under the Mediterranean. I should show where it is. <laughs> so I'll draw another bad map. Another bad map. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one of my bad maps. If this is Egypt. And this is the Nile Delta, which we'll say, even though it doesn't look much like it. Alexandria is right about here. Uh, Alexander found it is a new capital for Egypt there because it's in the shipping lanes. Right, because it was on the coast. Well, if you know anything about river deltas, like in Louisiana or, or any other major river delta, they're very fertile for crops because of the soil that keeps getting deposited there at the end of the river, but that soil is also very unstable. It's prone to flooding, and there is a big chunk of ancient Alexandria that's now underwater in the Mediterranean that's shifted off. And actually, modern Alexandria is really the, the center of the city is several miles south of where ancient Alexandria was because it's sort of slid off. The soil is slid off into the, into the ocean. Like New Orleans. Like New Orleans, right. It, it's the same kind of thing that's happened there. Like Ephesus. <laughs> and Ephesus in, uh, in Asia Minor, in Turkey. So that, that, just, that happens when you build in a river delta. <laughs> it's, it's not a stable place to build. So yeah, they have found the, but the, the I mean, the contents are gone. Oh, yeah. the, con the contents of that library are lost to history. And so, you know, if you hang around in nerdy professorial circles, as used to be my want, you will often hear people start pining for what might have been lost. You know, uh, what wealth of knowledge might we have had if we... <laughs> okay. So, one, one last note. As I was saying, that the, in Egypt, we've got this blend of pagan Egyptian culture with Greek culture. And so, so you get a lot more emphasis on the king being a god, but he's also, he also takes his role as pharaoh seriously. So just as a note, this particular Ptolemy IV married his own sister. <laughs> Who was his queen until he got tired of her. And then in true kingly fashion, he had her executed. <laughs> so that was. Is he related to King Herod? No, no, no. Not that, not related to Henry VIII either, to my knowledge. But so <laughs> that that I think suffices to say. Anybody have any questions before we get started? Yes, okay, so that gives you an idea of kind of what's going on in Alexandria and in Egypt at this time. And like I said, it starts about 220 BC takes place between about 220 and 200 BC. Okay. So 3rd Maccabees chapter 1. When Philopater heard from those who returned that the regions he ruled had been captured by, by Antiochus, he issued orders to all his infantry and cavalry forces, took his sister Arsinoe along with him, and set out toward the area near Raphia, where the forces of Antiochus were positioned. So his sister is there is also the queen. And the Antiochus is Antiochus the third. 
Okay, so as we saw at the beginning of first and second Maccabees, even though the first generation of generals was content to sort of divide things up, their successors have kind of pushed the boundaries back and forth in terms of controlling what territory. So previous to this, Ptolemy's father had pushed his border up a little ways into the Middle East, and now Antiochus III is pushing back. He's now taking back some of the territory that Ptolemy's father had taken. So Ptolemy IV hears about this, takes his queen, takes his men, and goes out to try to stop <laughs> this loss of territory. Verse 2, Now a certain Theodotus, intending to carry out a plan he had developed, took the finest of the Ptolemaic weapons issued earlier to him, and crossed by, by night to Ptolemy's tent with the intention of killing him by himself, and in that way ending the war. So this guy is what we call a traitor. <laughs> So his idea is, we get this war real easy, we just kill the Egyptian king, let the Syrian king take over both pieces of territory. No more fighting. But Dositheus, called the son of Drimalus, by birth Jew, who afterward changed his religion and apostatized from the traditions of his fathers, removed the king and put in his place a certain unimportant man in the tent. That man suffered the vengeance intended for the king. Isn't that nice? Rather than, rather than just ratting the guy out, saying, oh, he's going to come kill the king, let's ambush him. He goes and finds somebody who's not important. <laughs> Has him sleep in the king's bed, so he gets assassinated instead. But it at least serves the purpose of, of, he, of through trickery, he saved the king's life. Okay. And he's an example, as it says, just as there were a lot of Jews in Judea and in Palestine who were attracted to the Greek way of life who gave up being Jewish and just sort of assimilated the same thing has happened with a lot of the Jews in Egypt verse 4 when a fierce battle took place and things were going rather well for Antiochus Arsinoe went and exhorted the soldiers with her cries and tears with her hair disheveled she urged them to be brave to defend themselves and their children and wives she promised to give each of them two minas of gold if they were victorious. So it happened the enemy was defeated in hand-to-hand -hand combat and many were taken captive. But having prevailed against the plot, Ptolemy decided to visit and encourage the neighboring cities. In doing so, and by enriching their sacred precincts with gifts, he built up the morale of the conquered people. <laughs> so he, he wins the fight, right? He wins the battle. A little inspirational speech from his sister wife. <laughs> and, then, and then afterwards he says well look this guy tried to assassinate me he's no dummy he says this means I am unpopular <laughs> right he's just taken back this territory he's taken back these cities right he's got a popularity problem so he says well I better go and visit these cities that I've just reconquered right try to try to build some morale Right, try and get my approval numbers up <laughs> here with these here with these cities, and so the way he chooses to do that is he goes to their temple districts, right? Gives them money, helps them build, fit repairs, you know, new statues, that kind of thing. Now the problem here is going to be that one of the cities he just took back happens to be Jerusalem, as we're about to see. Verse 8, when the Jews sent representatives to him from the Senate, they greeted him, brought him gifts, and congratulated him on the way things turned out. He was favorable to them and eager to visit them soon. Okay. So the, the Jews sent him gifts, <laughs> right, preemptively. Say congratulations on conquering our city, on winning the battle. Verse 9, when he came to Jerusalem, he sacrificed to the Almighty God and made thank offerings and did what was appropriate in, in the place. The place being here, as we saw in 2 Maccabees, it's a reference to the temple. In coming into the holy place, he was astonished at its excellence and beauty. And he admired the good order of the temple and conceived a desire to enter into the inner sanctuary. <laughs> this is where things go wrong. Right? He comes, he wants to offer sacrifices to, to the God of the Jews. Well, that's okay. 
you know. So they took care of it. They got the right kind of animals. They got the right, right? They sacrificed him. He said, wow, this temple is beautiful. Everything good so far. Then he decides he wants to go back into the Holy of Holies, right? Well, why would he think he could do that? That seems rude. He's a God. He, exactly. <laughs> he's a God. So if he's a God, he should be able to go back there and talk to the Jewish God, right? They're both gods, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's true. Well, That's because <laughs> because he's a Gentile, so he might not adopt. So he's unclean. No. So if he went back in there, if they let he would go into the sanctuary, well, then he would have been doubly unclean because he would have been a dead Gentile corpse. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to live. <laughs> <laughs> so, but so. They, they would have, I mean, from their perspective, they'd have to rededicate, I mean, like the, the, they had to later, after the about it, they have to rededicate the whole temple, right? So, you know, again, from his understanding, how do you imagine he might react to this? <laughs> Verse 11, they told him, however, it was inappropriate for him to do this, since even citizens of their own nation were not allowed to enter, nor even all the priests, only the high priest who was first over all of them could enter, but only once a year. Ptolemy, though, was not at all persuaded. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> so he says, yeah, 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 whatever, right? <laughs> because it's like, yeah, you've got a high priest. He's a god, <laughs> right? God trumps priest, right? <laughs> Even high priest, okay? It's verse 12, even when the law was read to him, still he would not stop insisting that he should enter. So they go and they get the Torah. You know, they get the scrolls. They're like, no, look, we're not making this up, right? <laughs> they read him the rules. They say, see, these are the rules. They read them to him. You can't go in there. He still insists he wants senators saying, even if others are deprived of this honor, I must not be deprived. <laughs> right? He says, yes, I know you don't let the little people in there. I, however, am not one of the little people. Then he asked why nobody ever prevented him from going into all the other shrines. Right? He said, everywhere else I go, I walk into the temples. And I never have a problem. What's with you people? <laughs> right? Someone said without thinking that it was improper to take that as a portent. When that happened, he said that he would enter anyway, whether they liked it or not. Verse 16, then the priests, fully vested, prostrated themselves and supplicated God Most High to help them in the present circumstances to turn away the impulse of the man of evil design. The temple was filled with their cries and tears. Those who remained in the city rushed out, supposing that something mysterious was happening. Okay, so the priests, they're all vested. They've just finished doing these sacrifices. Right? They don't wait. <laughs> they just immediately, he says, I'm going in there. They hit their knees and start <laughs> crying out, praying. And so the people in the city who hear this think something... <laughs> crazy is going. I think a riot's breaking up. So they all come to see what's going on. Verse 18, even the virgins who had remained in their chambers rushed out with their mothers and sprinkled dust on their hair, filling the streets with wailing and groaning. We commented on this before. We commented on this before. And this is, this is another important place where you could take our Protestant friends when they talk about where we have the feast of the entrance of the Theotokos into the temple, right? The word that's used, and we talked about this once before, but the, the word that's used to describe the Theotokos in Greek, Parthenos, okay. that word we translate, that we translate virgin. that we translate virgin doesn't just mean like a young woman who's unmarried and hasn't happened to have sexual relations yet. Right? It's implied that she's unmarried and hasn't had <laughs> sexual relations yet. But it refers specifically to people who are remaining virgin because they've dedicated themselves to God or in the pagan case to the gods. If you've ever visited Greece, you probably saw the Parthenon. Or if you see, the Parthenon gets its name from Parthenos. 
because it was the place where, in that case, what the Romans called the Vestal Virgins, <laughs> the, the virgins who were dedicated to the Greek gods, right? That's where they lived in Athens, in the temple district of Athens, okay? It's the same route. So, virgin doesn't quite, or maiden doesn't quite capture the meaning of it. It's more like none in present day. So, when, when uh, Luke tells us, St. Luke tells us in his gospel that the Theotokos was a Parthenos, right? That doesn't just mean she was young and she wasn't married yet and she hadn't had sexual relations. That's implied. It means that she was a young woman who had dedicated herself to God. Yeah. We know from history, even though it's not mentioned in the New Testament, that that happened at the temple. And we had in 1st Maccabees, and we have here in 3rd Maccabees again, from that time period mentioned to the fact that there are these women who have dedicated themselves to the Lord at, at the temple in Jerusalem. Okay. So, St. Luke, when he writes his gospel and uses this word to describe the Theotokos, doesn't have to, because the audience he's writing to knows what he's talking about. <laughs> He doesn't have to spend three paragraphs explaining, oh yes, well, in our time in history, <laughs> there were women who dedicated themselves to the service of the Lord and lived at the temple. And, you know, going into all that, because everyone he wrote to knew that. Right? Knew, knew exactly what that meant. Okay? And so, so this is important here. Here's another place where we see, where you can take someone to show, if you say to them, well, there were women who dedicated themselves to God in the temple, they say, oh, show me that in the Bible. Right? You could take them here, they'll say, well, 3rd Maccabees isn't in the Bible. And you say, yeah, but it was written in 200 B.C., which means there were women doing that in 200 B.C. <laughs> okay? It's, it's just historically, it's provable <laughs> that there were women who did that. And St. Luke is referring to the Theotokos as one of them. Also on that note, it's important to remember this when, when we confess that the Theotokos, we say that she's ever virgin. Right? And people will get into these kind of gross arguments. You know, well, does that mean she never had sexual relations with Joseph? And better? That's implied, but that's not the core of what we're getting at. The core of what we're getting at is that it isn't that the Theotokos was one of these women, like a nun, who dedicated herself to God. And then she had Jesus, and then she just said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> Wandered off, retired. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, you know, I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. So that's not how she's depicted in the rest of the New Testament. Right? Where she's traveling with Jesus, where she's with the apostles in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes. Right? She was dedicated to God her whole life. That's what we're confessing when we say she's ever virgin. It's A.E. Parthenos. A.E. meaning ever. Parthenos. Her whole life she spent dedicated to God. Her whole self. Yeah. And so this is, and this is where, and this is obviously the tradition where female monasticism comes from. Our practice of having nuns, of having women who dedicate themselves to living that kind of life in the church today. So this is another place where they appear here in the Old Testament. So they hear what's going on with the priests and they come out and they start mourning too because they realize what's going on. Verse 19, those two who were recently brought to their bridal chambers abandoned the modesty that was appropriate for them and raced through the city in a disorderly manner. So these are the recently married. Remember in, in Deuteronomy, in, in the law of Moses, after you got married... The, no one was allowed to put any obligations on the couple for a year. That he was for a year, they were supposed to enjoy each other's company and start having, start having children and not be out and about doing business. Well, this is saying even those who were recently married when they heard what was going on came running out. <laughs> even though it was considered immodest. 
to find out what was going on. At that point, mothers and nurses even abandoned their newborns here and there, some at home and others in the streets, and without looking back, crowded to the Most High Temple. The prayers of those gathered were of varied forms because of what the king was plotting in such an unholy way. Besides, more aggressive citizens would in no way tolerate the carrying out of his plan or the fulfillment of his intention. So what they're saying is, everybody starts crowding into the temple, right? The priests are praying, asking God to stop him. Some of the people of the town aren't content with that. They're about ready to go, you know, physically try and try and stop him. They shouted to their neighbors to make a run on the weapons and to die courageously for the law of their fathers. Because the king, of course, has his bodyguard with him, right? So they're saying, we, need to, we can't let him go in there. We need to rush him. Some of us will probably be killed by his bodyguards, but we need to do whatever we have to to stop him from going in there. They created a great disturbance in the place and were barely restrained by the aged and the elders. They took up the same posture of prayer as the others. In the meantime, the multitude returned to prayer as before. The elders close by the king made many attempts to divert his haughty mind from the plan he had concocted. But in his arrogance, he dismissed everything they said and began to approach the place determined to complete his plan. When those around the king observed this, they turned to one another and called upon him who is all-powerful to come to their aid in this current struggle and not to ignore this lawless and arrogant act. But because of the continual impassioned shouting of the crowds, it seemed that not only those present, but also the very walls and the earth itself were echoing the cry, for they all preferred death to the profaning of the temple. Okay, so that everybody's yelling so loud, the buildings... <laughs> starting to shake and vibrate you know, while they're yelling. Notice though, again, we talked about in 2 Maccabees, the beginning of the idea of martyrdom, we talked about the group of people who would rather die than sin. Right? Uh, that is a, that's a sort of a goal for us in the Christian life. This is, we're seeing a similar thing here. These people would rather die than see, than see God's honor drug through the mud by him doing this chapter 2 the high priest Simon bent his knees before the temple and stretched out his hands with great dignity calmly offering the following prayer O Lord, Lord King of the heavens and master of all creation Holy One among the Holy Ones the only ruler the Almighty attend to us who are grievously oppressed by an unholy and irreverent man who is arrogant in his audacity and power for you the creator of all and ruler of all are a righteous master and you judge those who do anything with insolence and arrogance. In the past you destroyed those who acted unjustly, among whom were the giants who trusted in their physical strength and boldness, whom you destroyed by bringing the great flood of water upon them. You burned up with fire and brimstone the inhabitants of Sodom who acted in arrogance and were notorious for their evil acts, and you made them an example for those who came after them. You made known your might and power among men and brought many different acts of punishment on the arrogant Pharaoh who enslaved your holy people Israel. For when he chased after them with horse-drawn chariots and a myriad of troops, you overwhelmed him in the depths of the sea and brought across to safety those who trusted in you, the King of all creation. So when they considered the works of your hands, they praised you, the Almighty God. You, O King, created the endless and measureless earth and chose this city you sanctified this holy place for your name and hallowed it by its magnificent appearance, even though you have no need of anything. You made its structure solid for the glory of your great and honorable name. Because you love the house of Israel, you promised that if we should suffer setbacks and if distress should overtake us, you would hear our supplication when we came into this place to pray. Indeed, you are faithful and true, but often when our fathers were afflicted, you helped them in humility and saved them from great evils. Behold, O holy King, how we are oppressed because of our manifold sins, subjected to our enemies and lying in helplessness. Now notice, notice something about the character of his prayer here. First part, thanking God for all the good things he's done for them. Right? But now, when he turns to the current situation, whose fault does he say the current situation is? Theirs. Right, we're in this mess because of our sins, God. We know it. <laughs> right, we're not we're not pretending we deserve your help. <laughs> right, you did all these good things for us. 
we're sinful. That's why we're being ruled over by these, by these even Greeks. That's why we are having all this trouble. In our downfall, this arrogant and ungodly man continues to desecrate the holy place which is dedicated to the name of your glory on the earth. Your dwelling place, the heaven of the heavens, is unapproachable by men. But since you, by your grace, consented to grant your glory upon your people Israel, you hallowed this place. Do not punish us for the defilement caused by these men, and do not chastise us for this profanity. Do not allow these lawless people to brag in their anger and exult in the pride of their tongues, saying that they trampled the house of holiness as the houses of abominations are trampled. So what does he ask? Doesn't ask God to kill the king. (laughs) Doesn't say have him drop dead if he walks in there. Doesn't say free us from these Greeks. We're sick of them. Right? What he says is, what he's about to do, don't hold us accountable for. (laughs) Right? We've sinned enough and we're now taking (laughs) our punishment for our sins. But what he's about to do, hold him accountable. Right. And at the end, don't let him go. Don't let him go around and slander you, God, by saying that he was able to walk around in your temple the same way he walked around in those other shrines that he brought up before. Right. So what he's asking is, is essentially for God to protect his own reputation. Right. When he was going through the the history of what God had done for them. He talked about how God had built this reputation against Pharaoh, against all these, against Sodom, where people said, testified that God was just, right? And that God had loved Israel, that God was was the God of the whole world, was the true God. He was saying, don't let this guy get away with dragging your name through the mud and ruining that reputation. Verse 19, wipe away our sins, disperse our errors, and display your compassion at this hour. Let your mercies come upon us quickly. Get, grant praise in the mouth of us who have fallen and are crushed in our souls. And bring us peace. Here's where he makes the request for himself. And again, it's not get rid of these Greeks. Right? The Greeks aren't the problem. Right? He asks for the forgiveness of their sins. And this is something that we, a lot of the time, myself included, don't get in our lives. Right? We have a disease that's called sin, and we have some particular disease, some particular sin or other, and that disease manifests itself in symptoms. Right? Just like you get a disease, you get a fever, your nose gets clogged up, <laughs> you get symptoms. You get aches and pains. Right? Well, those symptoms in our lives from sin are messed up relationships, right? Trouble and strife with people around us. We get short-tempered, right? We get angry, we get, we get sullen and despondent. And when we pray to God, we tend to pray to ask God to take away the symptoms, <laughs> right? God fix this relationship. God help me not to be help me not to be so short tempered. Right? God help me not to say something I'm gonna regret. Right? God help me feel happier. We don't ask him to fix the problem that's causing those symptoms. Right? We don't say, God, can you help me with this pride that's causing me to shoot off my mouth to other people and offend them and hurt them and make me look like an idiot. Right? We don't ask God, God, can you take away this jealousy and anger I've got inside of me <laughs> that's causing me to be so short-tempered and causing me to... We, we don't ask for God to cure the disease. We ask Him to take away the symptoms, which He's not going to do. <laughs> because imagine if you were sick with a physical disease and you prayed and asked God to take away the symptoms. God, take away the aches and pains in my joints. Take away my fever. Take away... And he took away all the symptoms and didn't take away the disease. What would happen? You die. (laughs) You die. The symptoms are there to warn you of the disease so that you can try to fix it. 
save as true as sin. He's not going to take away the consequences of our sin. Because those consequences are there to try to bring us to repentance to fix what the real problem is. And this prayer by Simon the High Priest is a great example of that. Because he, does, he doesn't pray, God overthrow these pagan Greeks who don't worship you. He doesn't pray for God to take away the problems that they're experiencing. He prays that he would wash away their sins. That he would restore them to righteousness. Because he knows that if that happens, if that happens, if the problem with this, then the consequences will take care of themselves. Consequences will take care of themselves. So verse 21, Then God who watches over all, our holy forefather among the holy ones, heard this lawful supplication and scourged the man who raised himself up in arrogance and audacity. He shook him on one side and the other as a reed is shaken by the wind, so that he lay powerless on the ground. Besides being paralyzed in his limbs, he was unable to cry out since he was struck by a righteous judgment. So as soon as Simon finishes this prayer, all of a sudden... King Ptolemy has what sounds like a massive seizure. (laughs) Massive seizure falls on the ground. is unable to speak. Therefore his friends and bodyguards alike were struck by an overwhelming fear, seeing the severe punishment that overtook him. Fearing he would die, quickly they dragged him away. Later when he recovered, he still did not repent after being chastised, but went his way making bitter threats. So, Later on, he recovers. Does he say, wow, I should have listened <laughs> to those Jews and not messed with their God? No, he say, walks away saying, I'm going to get those Jews. Because somehow they did this to me. So verse 25, when, Then Ptolemy crossed over to Egypt where he increased his evil, assisted by the aforementioned drinking companions and comrades who were unacquainted with anything righteous, the writer of 3rd Maccabees is a little like the writer of 2nd Maccabees. <laughs> Let's you know what he thinks. He was not content with his countless acts of indecency, but audaciously proceeded to spread many evil reports throughout the region. Many of his friends observed the king's intentions and adjusted themselves to conform to his will. He undertook to spread abroad a public blame against the Jewish nation, and raising a plaque on the tower at the palace, he carved this inscription. No one shall enter the temple who does not sacrifice, but all the Jews shall be gathered for a census for taxation and reduced to servant status. That servant should really be translated slave. (laughs) Reduced to slave status. Those who oppose this will be taken by force and put to death. Those registered are to be branded by fire on their bodies with the ivy leaf symbol of Dionysus. They will also return to their former status. So... He sets out right off the bat to go after the Jews, and as it says, most of the his court and the people around him, you know, being the obsequious <laughs> courtesans they are, all say, "Oh, that's excellent, King. I never liked those Jews either." Right, and so he, what he specifically decrees for them is that they're all going to be rounded up. They're all going to be reduced to being slaves, meaning they're not going to be considered citizens anymore. Meaning they're not going to have any rights. Right, no vote on anything. <laughs> No, uh, no ability to sue in the courts. All right, they're just going to be treated as slaves. And to hammer that point home, they're all going to be branded as slaves with the symbol of Dionysus, one of the pagan gods. All right, Dionysus, in particular, was the god of drinking and revelry. That's why the, there's a there's a leaf symbol. It's supposed to be like a grapevine. Okay, Dionysus was. Uh, a, a latecomer. He was actually one of the last of the Olympian gods to start being worshipped. And he would be worshipped in essentially elaborate, large, public, drunken orgies. Like Bacchus, Bacchus is, the, is the Roman name for Dionysus. It's the same. It's the same god. And so people would go and drink and have sexual relations with each other and they were trying to reach a point where and this is by their own description they would be possessed by these spirits 
that worked for Dionysus, the Bacchae, the Romans called them. These spirits would possess them and they'd run through the streets having these religious, often violent and sexual experiences. That was the goal of these religious exercises. So it's not just it's not just a pagan god, but it's this pagan god that he decides to brand. <laughs> a particularly, yeah, particularly demonic and wicked pagan god who who he decides to brand them with. Verse 30, but so as not to appear an enemy to all, he wrote underneath, if some of them prefer to join those initiated into the mysteries, they will have equal rights of citizenship with Alexandrians. Okay. What is that referring to? The, the mysteries are a set of cults, one of which was to Dionysus. There are late, late pagan cults, meaning they start around 300 BC. They're heavily influenced by the fact that, that Alexander, having conquered the Persian Empire, brought a lot of what was then Eastern religion back with him. And so there are several mystery cults that spring up. The one to Dionysus is particularly popular in Egypt. In Greece, there's one to uh, Demeter, who's the earth goddess, that's very popular. And among the Romans, the Roman military, there's a cult to Mithras that's very popular. These are all called mystery cults because they have secret rituals that nobody knows about except the members. Okay, in order to, to learn the secret mysteries, you have to go. And the initiation rituals into these mysteries are extremely bizarre. There, there are a few ancient books we have where they sort of expose the secrets of the mystery cults. One's called the Golden Ass. Um, and there's, a, there's a few others. And bizarre things, you know, they would, they would sacrifice a bull on a grate over a person's head so he'd be baptized in its blood. You know, um, people would be given hallucinogenic substances, you know, sort of led through these weird rituals and dark rooms and has to reach into baskets and grab things. And I mean, it's all sorts of weird, esoteric stuff. But the idea was that once you had done this and you were one of the initiates, you had somehow, you know, now you had some understanding of the world and of the spiritual and the supernatural that now no one else did. Right? And so, basically, <laughs> this, is, this is the counter offer to the Jews. If you don't want to be a slave, <laughs> and you don't want to have, you, you don't want to get branded, you don't want to lose all your rights. You can come and join one of the mystery cults. You can come and join, join our religion, become enlightened, <laughs> come enlightened like like me, <laughs> right, Ptolemy, you know. And then, and then, you know, you can retain your normal rights. You'll be treated just like any other Alexandrian. Verse 31, some then obviously hated the price required to maintain godliness in the city. So they gave themselves up willingly for they expected greater glory from the association they were about to have with the king. So some of them that just said, you know what, that's, that's not worth it, I'll just go join the cult. <laughs> right? I'm not getting branded. <laughs> right? I'm not losing everything. Verse 32, but most of them prevailed with a noble spirit and did not abandon their faith. They paid money to save their lives and fearlessly exerted themselves to be saved from the census. They remained hopeful of finding help while loathing those who isolated themselves from them. They considered them betrayers of the nation and therefore deprived them of friendship and assistance. Okay, so this obviously it creates a rift to the Jewish community, obviously. Because there are those who sell out... <laughs> join the cult, aren't considered Jews anymore and there are those who are going to stand fast and remain Jewish, continue worshipping the true God, who obviously resent that other group, you know, but who are now suffering under, you know they're having to bribe officials to try to avoid getting branded and be reduced to to slave status, or they're just getting branded and reduced to slave status <laughs> well well, you have, to, you have to understand. I mean, this is before electronic surveillance and drones and, you know, photography and, you know, 
So if you had enough money to bribe officials perpetually, <laughs> you know, and keep bribing them, you know, you could, you know, you could travel from city to city, and you know, you could use fake names that didn't have identification the way we had today. It was a lot easier to do that sort of thing in that time period. So chapter 3, when the ungodly king heard this, he reached such a point of rage that he was angry, not only at the Jews of Alexandria, but even more so against those in the countryside. So he commanded that they all be brought together in one place and put to death by the worst possible means. So he finds out that, you know, apparently his intent was that when he issued that decree, they'd all join the cult. Because when he finds out that some of them aren't, and that some of them are getting around it by going out into the countryside, by bribing officials, by doing this, he gets so mad he decides to round them all up and just kill them all. While these things were being organized, an antagonistic rumor was circulated against the Jewish nation by men who conspired to harm them. This was on the pretext the Jews hindered others from the observance of their customs. So what they're saying there is, they start another rumor that the Jews are trying to stop the pagans from being pagans. <laughs> Why is that important? Well, as we talked about in 2 Maccabees, right, the, the Egyptians right, believe that the reason the Nile floods every year, giving them the fertile soil to plant crops in, is that the Nile god is happy. <laughs> and so they offer sacrifices, they offer their worship to the god of the Nile, and they believe the god of the Nile then gives them fertile crops. Okay. Well, the rumor they start is not only are the Jews not sacrificing to the Nile god and not helping us, they're trying to get the pagans to stop doing it. Right? So if they all stop doing it, this is going to be a disaster for Egypt. Right? Verse 3, the Jews though maintained their goodwill and unswerving faith toward the throne. But because they worshipped God and lived by his precepts, they kept themselves separate from others with regard to food, and therefore appeared hateful to some. So essentially, they're, they're loyal to the government as far, insofar as they can be, but because they're trying to keep the law of God, they have to behave differently in some respects. And because they're different, it causes this animosity. But they adorn their way of life with the good deeds of righteous people and thus established themselves as honorable to all men. Yet those of other nations took no account of the good works the Jews offered the nation, which was the common talk of all men. Instead they droned on about the difference in worship and foods, saying the Jews were not committed to the king or the authorities, but were hostile and in great opposition to his leadership. Therefore they attached no ordinary blame to them. Now there were Greeks in the city who had not been harmed in any way by the Jews, Yet they observed the growing crowds and unprecedented tumult surrounding these people. But they could not help them because they lived in weakness under tyranny. But they attempted to comfort them and being grieved hoped for a change in the situation. For it was incomprehensible to ignore such a large group which had done no wrong. But already certain neighbors and business associates drew them aside, gave them pledges of protection and offered more serious efforts toward their defense. So part of the answer to that question in terms of them bribing officials and stuff is there are some people who are sympathetic. People who know them, who have friends who are Jewish, you know, who are willing to help them try to get around. Get around the decree. So it's not just all bribery. There are people who sympathize. Verse 11, Then the king who exalted himself in his current prosperity and did not consider the power of the Almighty God assumed he could persist continually in the same purpose. So he wrote this letter against them. King Ptolemy Philopator, to the commanders and soldiers in Egypt and the surrounding region, greetings and health. I myself and my government are well. When our expedition to Asia took place, as you know, and was brought to completion according to expectation by the help of the gods not lightly given, we thought it fit not by force of the spear, but by equity and great benevolence to foster the peoples inhabiting Colossaria and Phoenicia and to willingly treat them well. We distributed large revenues to the priests around the cities and also went to Jerusalem to honor the temple of those guilty people who never cease from their folly. They accepted our presence in word yet were insincere in their deeds. For when we were eager to enter their inner shrine and honor it with extraordinary and most beautiful votive offerings, I just wanted to go in there and honor them. 
with my presence. <laughs> and with the incense I was going to burn. We were carried away by arrogant old men who prevented us from entering. But they were spared the exercise of our strength because of the benevolence we have toward all men. Yet as they kept up their obvious hostility toward us, they became unique among the nations because they lifted their heads against kings and benefactors and did not want to consider any deed as sincere. But we adapted ourselves to their foolishness and crossed into Egypt with victory. <laughs> we returned to Egypt victorious. <laughs> Somehow. We met all nations with kindness and did what was proper. Yet in this matter we proclaimed forgiveness to all of their kinsmen in Jerusalem. Then because of our confederacy with them and the many things we entrusted to them in sincerity from of old, we dared to make a change and grant them the honor of Alexandrian citizenship. That's his summary of the decree he issued. We offered them Alexandrian citizenship. If they joined a cult. <laughs> I gave up all of their cultural traditions. So this way they would be partakers of the things that are always sacred. They, however, took it in a different spirit. <laughs> With their innate malice, they rejected it and turned aside to evil. Not only did they reject the priceless citizenship, but they even showed loathing in word and silence toward the few among them who were sincerely disposed toward us. So quite in keeping with their infamous way of life, they suspected that we would quickly reverse our policy. Therefore we place great trust in the signs that these men's were, men were ill-disposed toward us in every way. Thus we took precautions against the possibility that a sudden disturbance might rise up against us later. For we considered these impious men to be betrayers behind our backs and barbarian enemies. So we have ordered that as soon as this letter arrives, those who live there with their wives and children should be sent to us immediately by force and iron shackles, bound securely on all sides, for a fatal and shameful massacre as is fitting to traitors. When they have been punished, we are certain that our government will be established afterward in tranquility and security. Just need to get rid of all the Jews and then we'll be fine. <laughs> right. But whoever conceals any of the Jews from old men to infant or even sucklings, right, meaning newborns, will be killed with the cruelest tortures along with his entire household. Whoever is willing to give information will receive the estate of the one who is punished, as well as 2,000 drachmas of royal silver, and will be crowned with freedom. Okay. So if you're helping the Jews and somebody else rats you out, the guy who rats you out gets everything you own, plus 2,000 silver coins from the king. Right. Every place without exception where a Jew is found concealed will become desolate and burned with fire and will become useless for all time for every mortal creature. This is the manner in which the letter was written. Okay. Now just pause for a second. Remember how he started the letter? Remember his nickname? Ptolemy the fourth, the loving father to his people. <laughs> So chapter 4, wherever this decree arrived, a feast at public expense was arranged for the Gentiles with shouting and rejoicing, as the hatred they had harbored against the Jews before now appeared openly. But for the Jews there was unceasing sorrow and lamentable crying with tears. Everywhere their hearts burned, and with groans they bewailed the unexpected destruction that was suddenly inflicted on them. But was there any district or city or any inhabited place whatsoever, or any streets that were not filled with their mourning and wailing? For they were being sent off by the commanders of the city in such a bitter and ruthless spirit that even when some of their enemies saw them receive such unusual punishments before their eyes, they considered them a common object of pity and wept for their miserable expulsion and the uncertainty of their lives. They're being treated so badly that even the people who don't like them are troubled by what's happening. A large group of old men covered with gray hair was forced to march swiftly despite the sluggishness of their old age. With shameless violence, they were driven on a harsh journey. Young women who had just en stepped into their bridal chamber to enter married life exchanged delight for wailing. With their perfumed hair sprinkled with dust, they openly raised a lamentation instead of wedding hymns, as they were carried away together by the violence of the Gentiles. In shackles and in view of the public, they were dragged along violently to the boat of, the boat of embarkation. 
their husbands in their vigorous youthful prime and with nooses encircling their necks instead of flowers, pass the remaining days of their wedding feast in lamentations rather than feasting in youthful celebration, as they saw the grave already before their feet. But they were brought on board like wild animals in iron-bound restraints, some fastened by their necks to the benches of the ships, others with their feet secured in unbreakable fetters. In addition, they had the thick deck above them, Thus darkness covered their eyes on all sides, and they were treated like betrayers during the entire voyage. Okay, so he sends the decree out, and everyone takes it seriously. The Jews are being all brought as prisoners back to Alexandria. When they were brought to the place called Skedia, and their voyage was completed according to the king's decree, he directed that they be confined outside the city in the Hippodrome which had an immense outside perimeter. A hippodrome is a, is a uh, coliseum for horse racing. For horse racing. <laughs> so there's a famous hippodrome in, in Constantinople later in Roman history. But yeah, it's for horse and chariot racing. So that's why it has a huge outer perimeter. Jordan. <laughs> yeah, the Greek, most Greek, large Greek and Roman cities had one. And so if you ever saw Ben-Hur, <laughs> chariot race, that's in a hippodrome. So they take them to the hippodrome that has this huge perimeter, this big open space, and they can find them all there. He also commanded that at the appointed time, they be made a public example for those returning to the city and those going from the city to the country. Thus they could not communicate with the king's forces or in any way claim to be within the boundaries of the city. But as this took place, the king heard that their Jewish compatriots from the city often went out secretly to lament the shameful suffering of their brothers. Growing furious, he commanded that these visitors be treated in precisely the same way as the others, so they would not be spared any of their punishment. So he hears that some of the Jewish people who have thus far eluded the decree are going out and visiting and trying to pass things and help the ones at the Hippodrome. So he gives the order that anybody caught visiting the Hippodrome goes into the Hippodrome becomes a prisoner too. He further commanded that every tribe be registered by name, not for the toilsome servitude just mentioned, but so they would suffer the prescribed tortures and be put to death in a single day. The registration took place then with bitter haste and zealous diligence. It took 40 days from sunrise to sunset. It still remained incomplete. So there's so many of them that they spend 40 days trying to register all their names and what tribe they're from, and they can't don't manage to do it within that time period. The king was filled with great and constant joy as he established banquets, banquets to extol all his idols. With a mind that wandered far away from the truth, with a profane mouth he praised mute things that were unable to speak or offer help, and spoke improper things against the Almighty God. But after the aforementioned interval of time, the scribe suggested to him that he would no longer be able to accomplish the registration of the Jews because their number was so large. They said that although there were still many of them in the country, some of whom were gathered in their houses and others elsewhere in the region, it was impossible for all the commanders in Egypt to register them. But the king threatened the scribes more harshly, claiming they were bribed to provide the Jews a mechanism of escape. But he was clearly convinced when they proved what they said, for they showed him that the paper and writing pens they used were depleted. This was the activity of God's invincible providence helping the Jews from heaven. So the king is so obsessed with destroying them that when the scribes come and say, look, there's too many of them, we can't, we can't register them all, he accuses them of being traitors and trying to help Jews escape until they show up, no, look, here's the paper, right? here's the pen, we can't do it. Okay. Also notice that you know, while he's preparing this huge mass execution, he's also preparing big parties for his gods, big celebrations. So this mass execution, this genocide is going to be part of this big feast of his. Chapter 5. Then the king, filled with wrath and anger and inflexible in every respect, summoned Hermon, the keeper of the elephants. On the following day, he ordered that he take all the elephants, 500 in number, and get them drunk with plenty of unmingled wine and abundant handfuls of frankincense. By feeding them frankincense, essentially it would have a hallucinogenic effect. So the idea is he's going to make the elephants go crazy. Turn violent, yeah. 
Then after they had grown wild from the bounteous abundance of drink, he was to lead them where the Jews would meet their fate. So they're going to take the 500 elephants, get them to go crazy, and just set them loose. Set them loose on the Jews. And this would be big entertainment for his party guests to watch watch these people be trampled by elephants. When he issues these directives, he resumed his feasting along with those of his friends and of the army who were particularly hostile toward the Jews. Then Herman, caretaker of the elephants, obediently carried out all his orders. The servants responsible for the Jews went out at evening, binding the hands of these unfortunate people, and managed to keep them in custody all night. They expected the whole nation would meet a final destruction. But the Jews, thinking they were deprived of all protection from the Gentiles because of being bound on all sides, called out to the Lord Almighty, Sovereign of all authority, their merciful God and Father. With tears and with a cry not easily silenced, they prayed that he divert the unholy plot against them with a vengeance by a glorious appearance and save them from their fate now present before them. Their supplication went up earnestly to heaven. Now Herman got his pitiful elephants drunk by filling them up with a great abundance of wine and frankincense. Get a little editorializing. Then he came to the court early in the morning to make his report to the king. But God sent on the king a deep sleep, that good gift for the beginning of time which he has cast on those he favors during both night and the day. Thus the king was restrained from his awful plan by the sweet and deep sleep from the Lord. He was disappointed in his lawless and unbending scheme. But when the Jews escaped the appointed hour, they praised their holy God and again beseeched him who was easily reconciled to show the strength of his almighty hand to the haughty Gentiles. By now it was almost the middle of the tenth hour, and the man in charge of banquet invitations arranged the guests together, came forward and nudged the king. So the tenth hour is about four o'clock in the afternoon. (laughs) Okay, so the day's gone on, the king's still asleep. So somebody finally comes and nudges him. As soon as he finally roused him, he made a report about what was happening and informed him that the hour of the banquet had already passed. But as the king considered this, he returned to his drinking and commanded those around him at the banquet to locate opposite him. When this was done, he urged them to give themselves to still more eating and drinking, so the effect of the banquet would be still more raucous. As the festivities progressed, the king summoned Hermon and with a direct threat asked why the Jews had made it alive through the present day. But when Herman declared that while it was still night, he had done what was ordered, the king's friends confirmed this. Then overcome with a savagery worse than that of Phalaris, the king said that because of the day's sleep, they received favor. But without delay on the coming day, Herman would ready the elephants for the extermination of the godless Jews. Because from his perspective, they're godless. (laughs) Because they don't worship the gods. This is an interesting thing most of the Christians who were killed by the Romans, the official crime that they were executed for was atheism. (laughs) Because they didn't believe that Caesar was a god and they didn't believe in the Roman gods. So, atheism now has a different definition, obviously. But this is from the perspective of the pagans, by only having this one god that they'll worship, they're basically atheists. You know, it's like, what about all the other gods? (laughs) So when the king had spoken, all the guests present willingly and joyfully agreed with the plan, then each departed for home. However, they did not use the night for sleep, but to devise all sorts of insults for those they assumed had met their doom. As soon as the cock crowed at dawn, Herman harnessed the beasts and set them in motion in the great colonnade. Crowds had gathered around the city for this pitiful sight even before dawn. But the Jews at their last breath and at the last moment made a tearful supplication and mournful songs. They stretched out their hands to heaven and prayed to the Almighty God to quickly help them again. The rays of the sun were not yet spreading when Herman stood by and called the king and his friends who were waiting. He pointed to the door and showed them what the king desired was ready. But when the king received the report, he was terrified at the unusual invitation to come out. Completely overcome with bewilderment, he asked what this was which had been done so quickly. This was an act of God, master over all things, who placed a forgetfulness in the king's mind about what had been plotted before. Okay. Now it's here an act of God's providence, but he also just drank until he blacked out for about <laughs> 12 hours, then got up and started drinking again. Right? 
So they get ready this mass slaughter of the Jews. The elephants are ready. They call him out. They're like, okay, the elephants are ready to trample all the Jews. And he's like, what? <laughs> you told us to do this. I, uh, what did I tell you? <laughs> but Herman and all the king's friends told him, the beasts of the troops are ready, O king, according to your eager purpose. But at these words, he was filled with deep anger because his whole plot had been scattered from his mind by God's providence. Then he glared at them and threatened, If your parents or children were here, I would furnish them as a lavish feast for the wild beasts, instead of these innocent people, who have shown me and my father's complete and unbending loyalty in everything asked of them. In fact, if it were not for my familiarity with you and your usefulness, you would be deprived of life rather than them. (laughs) So there's some confusion now. (laughs) Thus Herman endured an unexpected and dangerous threat, and his eyes shifted and his countenance fell. Then one by one the king's friends slunk away sullenly, and each one returned to his own business. But when the Jews heard what the king said, they praised God as the revealed Lord and King of kings, since this happened to them because of his help. Meanwhile, the king restarted the banquet. (laughs) He encouraged the guests to resume their merrymaking as before. Then he summoned Herman and threatened him, saying, How many times must you be given orders about these same things, you worthless wretch? Equip the elephants once again to crush the Jews tomorrow. So now he's he's back to, how many times do I have to tell you? Get the elephants to kill the Jews. So Herman, got to feel kind of bad for Herman at this point. (laughs) Right? (laughs) The guy just tries to take care of his elephants, you know? Verse 39, but his administrators who were reclining together with him, curious as to his unstable mind, (laughs) urged him, saying, How long, O king, are you going to tease us as if we were irrational? For you commanded now for the third time to destroy them. Then again you took back your command and what seemed good to you. Because of this the city is in turmoil, expecting you to act, and is in danger of being torn apart by the growing crowds. Right? So his guests are like, okay, what are you doing? You know, we get everyone all riled up. We're all out there to see the killing of the Jews. Then you call it off. Now it's on again, right? It's on, it's off, it's on, it's on. They're like, there's going to be a riot pretty soon if you keep, you know, <laughs> doing this to the people. At this point, the king of Phalaris in every way was filled with insanity and counting as nothing his changes of mind concerning the care of the Jews, swore a firm oath to send them to Hades without delay, mangled by the feet and knees of the wild beasts. He would then attack the Jewish land and abruptly level it to the ground with fire and the spear and burn down for all time the temple where they made sacrifices which had been made inaccessible to him. Then his friends and officials departed joyfully and confidently assigned the forces to the key places in the city to keep watch. Okay, so he swears an oath. He says, not only am I going to wipe out the Jews with the elephants tomorrow, then we're going to get the army together we're going to go to Jerusalem and level the place. Right? So they say, okay, good. Finally, we got some clarity here. Now we'll go. And so they get things set up for the next day. Then the keeper of the elephants brought the beasts almost to a state of madness, so to speak, with the sweetest drinks of wine mixed with frankincense. And he equipped them with frightful devices. Meaning he's putting, you know, metal points on their tusks and rams. and yeah. So about dawn, when the city was filled with countless hordes of onlookers filling the hippodrome, He went into the court and urged the king to fulfill his purpose. The king then worked up his depraved mind into a fit of wrath and rushed out in full strength with all the beasts. With hardened heart, he wanted to see with his own eyes the lamentable and evil crushing of the Jews. The Jews saw the cloud of dust stirred up by the elephants as they came out of the gate, the armed forces behind them. They also heard the trampling of the throng and loud, boisterous noise. They considered this the last moment of their lives and the end of their wretched uncertainty. Turning to one another in sorrow, they kissed each other with tears, and embracing their loved ones, they fell on their necks, parents and children and mothers and daughters, women with infants at their breasts, drawing their last milk. Nonetheless, when they recalled the help from heaven they had received earlier, they suddenly threw themselves face down, women taking the infants from their breasts, and they cried out in a loud voice, beseeching the master of all to have mercy on them, for they were standing at the very gates of Hades. Now there was a certain man, Eliezer, famous among the priests of the land, who reached the prime of his life in old age and adorned his life with every virtue. 
He directed the elders around him to call on the holy God, and he prayed as follows. O King Almighty in power, O Most High, the Almighty God, who governs all creation in mercy, look upon the seed of Abraham and the descendants of the saintly man Jacob, because a dedicated portion of your people, O Father, are being unjustly destroyed as strangers in a foreign land. Pharaoh abounded in chariots and was the master of this Egypt when he arose with unlawful boldness, a boasting tongue and an arrogant army. But you destroyed him by drowning him in the sea and appeared as a light of mercy to the nation Israel. Sennacherib also boasted in his countless forces because this oppressive king of the Assyrians had already taken the whole world under his authority by the spear. Then he was lifted up against your holy city and spoke grievously with pride and insults. But you shattered him, O master, and made your power visible to many nations. Then when the three companions in Babylon willingly gave their lives to fire, for they would not bow to vain things, you sent dew upon the fiery furnace and saved them to their last hair. You sent them back unharmed and turned the flames against their adversaries. Daniel was thrown to the lions below ground as food for lions because of jealous slander, but you brought him unharmed back up to daylight. Jonah was decomposing in the belly of the deep sea monster, but you, O Father, watched over him and returned him unharmed to all his kin. So now, O hater of insolence, O merciful defender of all, appear speedily to those of the family of Israel under outrageous abuse by abominable and lawless Gentiles. Even if our life has become enmeshed in unrighteousness during our captivity, save us from the hand of our adversaries, O Master, and destroy us by whatever death you choose. That's an interesting sense again. Again, he recounts what God's done in the past. He says, God, even if we've sinned and we deserve this, right, you punish us. You punish us with whatever kind of death you choose. Don't let this heathen man, this evil man, do it and be able to gloat about it. We do not allow these vain-minded men to praise their useless things, referring to their idols, as they destroy those you love, saying, Not even their God could rescue them. But you who have all strength and authority, O Eternal One, look down on us now, have mercy on us, who are being deprived of life like traitors by the thoughtless insults of lawless men. Let the Gentiles cower at your unconquerable power this day, O Honorable One, who has the power to save the race of Jacob. This entire multitude of babes and their parents beseech you with tears. Let it be revealed to all the Gentiles, O Lord, that you are with us, and that you did not turn your face from us. For as you said, not even in the land of their enemies did I neglect them. Do this for us, O Lord. Verse 16, when Eleazar finished his prayer, the king arrived at the Hippodrome with the beasts and with all the haughtiness of his army. Then the Jews who saw him cried out in a loud voice to heaven, so much so that the valleys nearby echoed and brought unrestrained fear on the whole army. Then the Almighty God, most glorious and full of truth, manifested his holy face and thrust open the doors of heaven, from which two glorious angels descended, terrible in form, and visible to all except the Jews. Let's pause there a second. Remember what he prayed. Again, he didn't pray, God, we don't deserve to die. Right? He didn't pray, God, bring doom on them. He said, God... Don't let them walk away from this. You know, if we deserve to die, that's fine. But don't let them walk away from this thinking that their pagan gods are more powerful than you. Right? He asked them to show the, to reveal himself and show the Gentiles that he was the true God. So what happens when these angels appear? All the Gentiles see <laughs> these two angels coming from heaven and the Jews don't. They attacked the enemy forces, filled them with confusion and fright, and bound them with immovable fetters. The king's body was seized with a tremor, and he even forgot his contemptible vocabulary. Then the beasts turned against the armed forces who were behind them, and they trampled and killed them. So the elephants turned around and killed the, the Greek military. The king's wrath was turned to compassion and tears because of the plot he devised earlier. For he heard the wailing and saw all the people who fell to destruction. So weeping with anger, he threatened his friends, shouting, You act as if you were the king yourselves, and you exceed tyrants in your savagery, and attack even me, your benefactor. You scheme to deprive me of my reign and my life itself with secret plots which are unprofitable to the kingdom. Who drove these people from their houses? 
who faithfully kept our strongholds and stupidly gathered all of them here? Gee, I wonder. (laughs) Who so unlawfully entangled in terrible dangers these who from the beginning differed from all other nations in their goodwill toward us and repeatedly accepted the worst pitfalls known to man? Release them, undo their unjust bonds, send them back home in peace and beg forgiveness for what you did to them. Set free the sons of the heavenly and living almighty God who has provided uninterrupted tranquility for our affairs from the time of our fathers until now. Thus he said these things, so the Jews who were released immediately kept praising their holy God and Savior, for they had at last escaped death. Then the king returned to the city and summoned the man in charge of the treasury. He commanded that he provide wine and everything else necessary so the Jews could feast for seven days. For the king thought it fitting that they celebrate their deliverance and rejoice in the very place they expected to meet their doom. Then those who had been treated disgracefully and were close to death or rather stood at death's door, were given a special invitation. They organized a feast of deliverance from the bitter and mournful fate of death. Filled with joy, their celebration took the place of their desolation and grave clothes. They ceased their chanting of lamentations and took up an ode to the ode of their fathers, praising their wonder-working God and Savior. They halted all wailing and lamenting and formed choirs as a symbol of joy and peace. Similarly, the king called a great feast to celebrate these things and ceaselessly and magnificently gave thanks to heaven for his unplanned experience of personal salvation. Those who believed previously that the Jews were going to be made food for the birds unto destruction and thus registered them with glee, sighed as they were covered with shame for their fire-breathing aggression was shamefully extinguished. Notice (laughs) his personal experience of That's an interesting English translation. But the idea is here, this is the best possible outcome. So remember all through the Old Testament, what was God's purpose for the Jewish people? His purpose was that they should, by following his teachings, by living the way they were supposed to, to be an example to all the other nations. So the other nations would come and worship God. Okay. Well, even when they're disobedient... (laughs) Even when things are going wrong, God can still make that happen. Right? God can still bring that about, as he did here. But the Jews, as we said before, formed the aforementioned choir and spent their time feasting with psalms of a joyful thanksgiving. They established a public ritual to commemorate these things within their entire community for the generations to come. They structured this observance as a festival, not for drunkenness and gluttony, but because of the salvation which they received from God. They then requested that the king dismiss them to return back home. Now, why is that note so important? Well, remember the king was a big fan of Dionysus. Right? So, they're having a feast, but not that kind of feast. (laughs) Right? They're having a celebration, not that kind of celebration. Okay? And we could celebrate, obviously, like we celebrate Pascha, without giving in to gluttony and drunkenness. <laughs> the, the purpose, and although this, I tend to do this too, the purpose of Lent is not to fast for 50 days so you can make yourself sick <laughs> by eating too much <laughs> on Easter. Right? The idea is you can celebrate without going in the other direction. Now the registration took place from the 25th of Pecan until the 4th of Epiphi, that is 40 days. They faced destruction from the 5th of Epiphi until the 7th, that is 3 days. During this time, the Lord over all things manifested his mercy with great glory and saved them all together and unharmed. Thus they feasted with everything provided by the king until the 14th day, when they also petitioned to be sent away. The king immediately granted their request and wrote for them the letter copied below to the commanders in each city, magnanimously stating his concern for them. So now, now he sends them all back to the, Now remember, he had them all deported in chains from these various cities. So now he's sending them back with this letter. King Ptolemy Philopator, to the commanders in Egypt, to do all those in authority in our government, greetings and health. We ourselves are well as are our children, with the great God guiding our affairs as we desire. Notice already what's changed. Remember, we were victorious in Syria because the gods, right? Now it's we ourselves are well as our children with the great God guiding our affairs as we desire. 
Some of our friends through malignity kept urging us and finally persuaded us to gather the Jews in our kingdom to have them punished in a body with unusual punishments as if they were rebels. They argued that until this was accomplished, our government would never be stable because, they're Ill, because of their ill will toward all nations. They led them out cruelly in fetters as slaves, or rather as traitors, and without making any inquiry or investigation, they attempted to attack them, girding themselves with fierceness more savage than that of the Scythians. The Scythians, by the way, were in what's now Romania. So apparently Romanians were really scary at this point in history. But because of the fairness we have toward all men, we threaten them severely for these things. Yet we barely spared their lives because we recognize that the heavenly God surely protects the Jews as a father protects his sons and fights on their behalf. We considered the steadfast goodwill they had toward us and toward our brothers and justly acquitted them from every manner of charge. Then we ordered our people to go about their business, each in his own place, with no one harming them or approaching them undeservedly for what had happened. For you know that if we plot any evil against them or trouble them at all, we will have not man but God the Most High, the Master of all power, unfavorable to us in vengeance for these things and inescapable in everything forever. Farewell. All right, so the, the brief translation of the letter is, I don't know why you people accuse the Jews <laughs> of all these things. We found them innocent and let them go. And just a warning, when they get back, I wouldn't try anything because their God is the one who will, <laughs> who will settle it. And I learned from personal experience that's not a good idea. Verse 10, when they received this letter, the Jews did not hasten to depart immediately, but rather petitioned the king that those of the race of Jews who transgressed the law of the holy God should receive the punishment they deserved. So they pause and say, well, wait a minute. What about all those former Jews? You know, you just said we were innocent. What about all those ones who went and, you know, joined your crew and who ratted us out to get our stuff? Remember when you were offering them the, the bounty? They proclaimed that those who transgressed the divine commands on account of their appetites would never again be favorable toward the king's government. So he accepted the truth of what they said and deferred to them, giving them permission in all things to destroy those who had transgressed the law of God throughout his kingdom with boldness and without any royal authority or supervision. Then their priests and the whole multitude extolled the king, and as was appropriate, responded with an alleluia and departed in joy. As they went their way, they punished and killed any one of their race they encountered who had defiled himself, putting him to public shame. So on that day they killed more than 300 men, and they held a joyous festival because they had overtaken those who were defiled. Then those who had held firmly to God to the point of death received the pleasure of their deliverance. They left the city wreathed in all sorts of sweet-smelling flowers with joyful shouts of thanks and praises and melodious hymns to the God of their fathers, the everlasting Savior of Israel. But when they reached Ptolemaeus, called the rose-bearing city because of the special character of the place, the fleet had waited there for seven days according to the plan they determined. They held a feast of deliverance there for the king who liberally supplied them with everything they needed for their journey home. When they reached land in peace with proper giving of thanks, they also decided to again set apart these days for joyful festivity during their stay. They marked these days on a column inscribed and set in the banquet site, consecrating it as a place of prayer. Then they went away safely through land, sea, and river, each to his own home, free and overjoyed by the command of the king. They had more honor than before among their adversaries, were held in esteem and awe, and none of them lost any of their belongings. Indeed, they reclaimed all of their own things which had been registered. If anyone held something of theirs, they returned it with the greatest fear, since the Almighty God had done perfectly magnificent works to gain their deliverance. Blessed is the Savior of Israel unto ages of ages. Amen. So that's the end of 3rd Maccabees. <laughs> so not only in addition to Judea, God was taking care of his people in Egypt, in Egypt as well, as we saw there. So that's it for our Maccabean. <laughs> that's also it for, this is, a, we're now, we're going to shift now into a whole different section of the Old Testament. From Genesis until now, for the last couple years, we've been going through what are basically the historical books. Right, the span of history, we've gone from a, from the creation of the world <laughs> to about 100, 120 BC now. 
Okay. Now the next set of books, there's two more sets of books in the Old Testament. The next set of books we're going to get into is what's called wisdom literature. We're going to start with Job in uh, the Septuagint and in the Orthodox Study Bible it goes Psalms, Job and other Old Testament you get it'll be Job, Psalms. I'm going with Job first because uh, some, G- some deacon George Davis has been doing Psalms in his adult Sunday school class. So I told him I wouldn't do s- Psalms at the same time as him. So <laughs> we're going to do Job first and also Job I think is particularly appropriate to do during Lent which we have coming up. <laughs> I think that'll be a good fit. And then we'll get into Psalms here in the summer after Pascha. So Job's going to be next. But Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes are what's called wisdom literature. Meaning these aren't going to be books giving us a historical narrative per se. It's going to, in various different formats, it's going to be people writing wisdom. Psalms, of course, is a book of hymns. Proverbs is a book of Proverbs of wise sayings um, I'm going to do a bigger introduction as we get into it next time but that's that's where we're moving next it's going to be a different type of book Job is also wisdom literature it's structured as basically a series of dialogues between Job and his friends and his wife and, and God ultimately um, so Job is where we start next and after we finish the wisdom literature the last big chunk of the Old Testament is going to be the prophets themselves and those are going to be the writings of the prophets and those take place at various points along the history we've already read. So as we go through the prophets, we'll be locating ourselves at various points in the history that we've read over the last over the last two years. Well, the Jews, uh, the, uh, I said not the Jews in Russia, or, or the Sephardic Jews in Spain, were they came from the Maccabees? Uh, They're later. Later. They're later. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. yeah. They came out. yeah. They, they joined in South and North Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's going to happen later. There are going to be a number of groups after the New Testament, even, is done. They're, they're including some Arab groups that are going to become, adopt the Jewish religion. So, yeah, and form other, other groups of Jews. And some of them are going to become Christian and then. Uh, with the with the Arab groups, when Islam comes, most of them end up converting to Islam. But yeah, that's that's later. That's a different scatter. That's the 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 term in Greek diaspora is used several times for the Jews. It means the scattering, and so there's sort of one scattering when Babylon destroys Jerusalem, like we've been talking about. We've now got Jews living in. In Egypt, we've got Jews living in Judea. We've got Jews living in Mesopotamia. We've got Jews who are deported to Asia Minor that we talked about in in 1 Maccabees. So that's one diaspora. But then when the Romans destroy Jerusalem at the beginning of the 2nd century AD, there's going to be another big scatter where Jews are going to move into Europe and, and east into in Babylon again and in all directions so that's a second sort of diaspora of the Jews at that time okay so does anybody else have any other questions oh. I have a question about um, the virgins in the temple didn't they make them leave when they were like 15 so did they go to Constantine or did they, they, they had to get married right so did the, they have to get married while they were menstruating they weren't allowed to be in the temple. And so they would be entrusted to their family home. If they didn't have family, like the Theotokos was born when her parents were very aged. So that's why she was entrusted to Joseph, who was an older widowed man to take care of. And then at the point where, at the point where they, uh, um, went through menopause to the point where they were beyond childbearing age. They would then come back. So it was like sort of. Sort of, yeah. Sort of. So that was, that was the practice regarding the temple of that. Okay, and, and there were also, I should add on that, and we'll see this when we get to the New Testament in a couple of years. <laughs> 
St. Paul will, will mention women being enrolled amongst the widows. And if you read the can, old canon law of the church, you'll hear about what age a woman could be enrolled among the widows. Because it was also common practice for women who were married, right, but who ended up widowed, because as we've talked about several times in these cultures, even up into the Roman Empire, single women, didn't, widowed women didn't have any legal rights or anything, for them to then enter, even though technically they were virgins, now that they were widowed, they would come and enter and be added to the rolls. So, uh, so you'll hear St. Paul in a couple of his epistles makes reference to women. He makes reference to virgins. He also makes reference to women being enrolled as widows, meaning, not meaning like, oh, now it's official, you're a widow, but <laughs> that they would, they would enter into essentially a convent at that point, at the end of their lives, once their, their children, if they had had any, were adults and were gone, and their, and their husband was deceased. So and they, they, there's a canon, I think it's a second ecumenical council that lowered the age, you could do that from 60 to 40. <laughs> there's not a lot of women live to be 60, I think. Was the, but so that was... Okay, thank you everybody.